been changing a bit today. Um, you can see by the date, this is a recycled talk. Uh, we're going to do a uh, talk on, uh, on forest history, uh, but I uh, just wasn't able to pull that together for this time. And uh, as you can see, I've got the endless cold that keeps coming back, so uh, I decided to uh, go the easy route. And this also kind of ties into what we're up to this weekend uh, with our suffrage at tea. So um, I've been... I've been doing talks on Pioneer Women from probably even before the days I actually formally did Brown Bank History and uh, it's really interesting to talk about uh, about uh, Pioneer uh, Pioneer Women. Uh, women's history is, uh, you'll have to dig a little bit harder uh, to, find, to find the stories. Uh, sometimes you even have to dig a little bit harder to find people's real names. Uh, most of the, in the newspapers, if there was a, a note about a, a, a local woman, she would be mentioned by her husband's name. So I'd be in the paper as Mrs. Ken English. Mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was the norm. And it wasn't usually until a woman died that you might find out her, uh, her real name. And uh, even, even then, sometimes in the obituaries it wasn't mentioned, so you'd have to go to the official records or the, to, to, to find out a woman's actual given name. Um, the, um, wanted to, uh, to start with a picture of a pioneer woman from my life. This was my grandmother. And uh, we, this picture just surfaced in our family a couple of years ago. I'd never, until, uh, a few years ago, I'd never seen a picture of my grandmother as a young girl. Um, I knew her. She was, uh, 80, she was 87 when, when she died. And uh, a remarkable woman with uh, 10 children during the Depression. And uh, it was, uh, they were a French-Canadian family. So uh, I just put her, put her in there to show uh, we all have we all have pioneer women in our lives, not in our mind. Uh, for years, uh, Catherine Fraser was referred to as the first decent white woman in Revelstoke, and the family had this story about how she stepped off the train in Revelstoke in May of 1885 to join her husband Fred here when he was working for the railway. Uh, but there's a couple of problems with that story. One is that there weren't any rails here until October of 1885. And the other is that through newspaper research, where I found that there were uh, that there were families that were settled here. There were workers that had brought their, their families here that early. So um, she definitely was one of the, the, the early pioneer uh, settlers to, to come here as a woman and as a... Hmm? And uh, as a as a, a, a wife, uh, you can see that they were married in uh, 1884 in Moose Jaw, which was then not even a province; it was part of the Northwest Territories. Mm -hmm. So there, there were other women here; they just weren't wives. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. That's, that's why they said decent white women. Mm -hmm. It assumes that they were. But I, I think we're, I found some notes to say that there were family women here as well. There were four women who were here with her. Uh, there was a newspaper note that I found in uh, about April of 1885, the Victoria colonists that said there were about, uh, of all the people in Revelstoke, there were about 12 families living here with their wives and children. So, um, but anyway, she certainly was an early pioneer here. And uh, they settled in the uh, the Big Eddy. They were uh, one of, among the first farmers in this district. They had a, an established farm by uh, 1886 in the Big Eddy, just right across the river from the the bridge. And uh, I remember if I put the photograph of their that was, we have another photograph showing their farmhouse with all of the the trees behind them and all the stumps. So you can imagine what a job they would have had to clear enough land to have a working farm. Um, they went on to have 10 children as well. well they were uh, their uh, second, uh, their first daughter was born back in Ontario. Mrs. Fraser went, uh, Catherine Fraser went uh, back to Ontario to have her first child. But her second daughter, 
uh, was uh, born in Revelstoke and was noted as the first white child to be born in the, in the, Kootenai, the, with the North Kootenai area. Uh, these were some of the uh, not <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> um, was really happy uh, when this photograph showed up a few years ago. It's the only photograph we've ever seen of the uh, the women of the red light district, as it was known, which was mostly centered in Farwell. There were houses on uh, Front Street and Douglas Street, and uh, so quite a few women were working as prostitutes at that time. Um, in, we have the police uh, record book from uh, 1900 to 1907, and uh, if you go through that and look at the, the names, I found the names of 50 different women who were charged with various charges of, of prostitution in the year 1900. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of women here who were, who were working as prostitutes. In the 1899 census, um, people put their um, their occupation down, and most of the women that I found in the police register, I uh, cross-checked their names, and a lot of them gave their occupation as uh, musician or housekeeper or cook, but a couple of them actually put their, their occupation as prostitute. Well, I'd be curious how many of those names translated into marriage records. Yeah, I haven't been able to, I haven't followed followed that up. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few of the women who were here were originally from the United States mm -hmm. and had, had come up and were working here. Um, it'd be <coughs> interesting to know their stories too because mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some... some was it a major source of income for the city at the time? Yeah, actually the, the city was getting quite a bit of money uh, in fines from the... They <laughs> <laughs> say we were living off the avails of prostitution at the time. Uh, but. The uh, average fine for a woman who was referred to as an inmate of a house was uh, $4, and the average fine for a madam who was a keeper of a uh, brothel was $20 per time. And most of these women were brought, being brought in like three, four, five times a year. Um, if a new woman came into town, if the police sort of corralled her early enough, they would just put her on the next train and send her out. But there was obviously quite an established group here. Um, if you look closely at the um, at that photograph, you can see that the photographs are a little bit more risque than what you'd find in a a, a normal living room in a <laughs> upper upper class Revelstoke home. Um, uh, at least a couple of nudes there if you look closely, and the women were were well dressed. I've seen quite a few stories of, uh, of how the the women were kind of seen as mysterious by especially some of the younger people in town and. Uh, they were their movements were restricted. They were only allowed to come up to town to shop uh, once a week, and they were brought up in in carriages and uh, and then went went back down. Um, there's also a story of a, a family that um, lived in in Lower Town, and the uh, woman had just had newborn twins, and uh, one of the girls from one of the houses uh, came to the door and and asked if she could see the babies and. Uh, the, the woman let her see the babies, and uh, the, uh, this young prostitute said, you know, I'd love to help you, but you probably don't want a girl like me helping. And the mother said, uh, I'd be happy to have you help. So this girl would come and help her with the twins. Mm -hmm. And then when the, uh, some of the church women of the town were circulating a petition to try to shut down the brothels, uh, they came to this woman's door, and she said, None of you came to help me with the twins, mm -hmm. but these, this girl mm -hmm. did, so I'm not going to sign your petition. Mm -hmm. so they, they showed more course Christian charity than you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, that's another story in itself. I think I have done talks this <coughs> morning, uh, on the, the brothels before, and it's uh, a topic in itself. I threw this in. I don't know a heck of a lot about her, but she's just got the most incredible hat. <laughs> um, her name was Myrtle Louise Temple, and uh, she lived here with her family for a few years. Her father was the master mechanic for the uh, uh, CPR, and uh, she was married in 1910 and then moved away from, from Revelstoke. So is that like her wedding picture? Um, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, well, actually, I couldn't say for sure. Uh, I'd have to go back to the family and, mm -hmm. and ask. Uh, wedding, wedding dresses weren't as, as traditional as they are now. You, you, you didn't 
women weren't necessarily married in white, they were just married in their best dress in most cases. So I can't say for sure, but could be. And uh, this one is a girl named Fanny Jolliffe, and on the original photograph it's written on there, Dress to Kill. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put that one on there, she's wearing a, a lovely stubby beaver muff and stool. <coughs> But I don't, the, the family lived here for quite a while. I don't know too much about them, though, but they were an early family. Um, this one is Adriana Kale Taylor. Uh, she married uh, T.E.L. Taylor in 1898. He was a pioneer businessman here. He was uh, involved with the uh, uh, Lawrence Hardware Company. He was involved with the Revelstoke Power and Light Company and with quite a few other businesses in town. And um, they had uh, five children. Their uh, first two died as babies, mm -hmm. including this little girl, oh, Ada, who died at about two years old. And they had uh, three sons that lived to adulthood, but all three of her adult sons predeceased died before she did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the um, Smythe family, uh, Hugh Smythe married Amy Howard Gibbon in 1896, and their first child, who's uh, being held in that photograph, was Marjorie Kelly Smith. She was born on uh, July 18, 1897. And their house at that time was at first in Mackenzie and was later moved to Connaught Avenue and it's still there. It's the little pink house right behind uh, Revelstoke uh, uh, Credit Union Insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family uh, moved to um, the Columbia Park area and they had a farm about where the, the Chevron station <coughs> in that area is now. Uh, this was uh, some of the other Amy is on this side and then uh, oh sorry Amy is in the middle and then Marjorie is on at the front here <coughs> this is Marjorie and that's the mother and the other some of the, her other sisters what was the average marrying age for would you say basically? It uh, tended to be between 18 and, and 23. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the the records that I marriage records that I've seen, it was uh, it was about that age. Mm -hmm. And all of the women, if they weren't previously married, were referred to as spinsters. <laughs> but that it's even says that on my marriage certificate. Oh, when I was married in 1978. So um, <laughs> just an unmarried woman was was. Uh, officially a spinster. It didn't matter what age she was. Uh, Marjorie uh, Parker, uh, or Marjorie uh, Smythe, um, married a fellow named Kelly and they had about uh, 10 children. And then she remarried uh, a, uh, a Parker. And uh, they were involved in the, in the city for, she was involved in it for a long time. We actually have a couple of oral histories done by her, and she has some pretty really amazing stories of growing up in this area. And uh, she was one of the first members of the Revelstoke Art Group that was formed by Sophie Atkinson in uh, the 19, uh, 1940s. And we have uh, several <coughs> of Marjorie's paintings in our collection as well. Um, this is a great photograph of, of some couple of early families here. Uh, May Adair. Uh, Elizabeth Brown, Kathleen McLean, and Lida Edwards. Um, May Adair married a uh, Lida Edwards brother, James, and uh, Kathleen McLean married a fellow named uh, Sutherland, who was uh, quite involved in um, with some of the hotels and businesses in town. And uh, Lida Edwards married Charles Holton, and they were the ones that lived in the Holton house at the top of First Street Hill, now Mustang Bay Breakfast. A picture of Lyda Holton with uh, one of her two sons around 1900. It must have been like not a huge group, like there must not have been a big group of women, like you know, 50 women in all of town kind of thing, or um, like they would have known each other. Or yeah, like, by, by 1900, they, they, the, the population was uh, was over a thousand, so okay. the, there would have okay. been a fair number of, okay. of women by then. It, it was still okay. probably majority of people in town were, were male, but it was starting to become more populated and more families were, were settling here by then. 
Mm -hmm. um, Light of Hope, and I think I've probably a lot of you have heard this story before. <coughs> uh, there's kind of a mystery sur uh, surrounding the, the Lida, uh, Lida's family. Uh, she was um, known when she came here as Lida Edwards. Her father was going by the name Charles Edwards. But Lida's uh, father's name was really Craven Silcott. And I'm pretty sure that the Charles Edwards who came here as her father was her real father, Craven Silcott. But Craven Silcott had been a cashier in a bank in the United States. It was a legislative bank. And uh, he was accused of embezzling funds and he fled the country and uh, changed his name to uh, Charles Edwards. And uh, they were living in Vancouver for a while when he was running a hotel there. And then they came here and they were running a hotel. And um, they be quickly became high society in town. But um, we're pretty sure that her father was, was this, uh, this crook, Craven Silcott. <laughs> um, all, on all of the official documents, her name is given as, as uh, Silcott, not as Edwards. No. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story. What happened to him, Kathy? What happened to, uh, Cra to he, he died here in Revelstoke, at, known as Charles Edwards. And in his obituary, it said that at one time he'd been an Australia, an, a sea captain in Australia. <laughs> so uh, when I tried to um, track this story back into the States, there's all sorts of different accounts. Uh, I found some, some genealogy sites as well, where there's one family member that believes that they, they fled to Mexico. There was another story saying that he had fled with his uh, French-Canadian lover to Quebec. Um, but um, <laughs> The only other version of events would be that, that Mrs. Silcott remarried a guy named Charles Edwards, but all of the, the whatever I've pieced together, I'm pretty sure that Charles Edwards and Craven Silcott were the same person. So uh, he was never, um, never went back to Ohio to, to face justice. Uh, we ended up with a lot of the personal documents from the Holton family after the uh, the house was sold from the last surviving member of the Holton family to the McDonnell family, and uh, they there were there was photograph albums, there were personal documents. We actually have Charles and Lida Holton's original uh, wedding certificate in our collection, and uh, it's it's interesting in it, in there because actually on the certificate there's this little inscription at the top. It said it says um, the um, the wife is uh, is crowned, to, or something about the, the 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 husband is head of the wife. The wife is the crown to the husband. Uh, so it says that right on the right on the, the gift on this wedding certificate. So it lays it out straight there. The husband's in charge. No questions about that. Um, but yeah, there. Are, I always find them quite a fascinating family. And as I say, we have all this uh, information in the archives about them. And there's even a letter sent from uh, a head of this, uh, somebody who was involved in this bank in, in Ohio to Mrs. Edwards saying, you know, we know that Mrs. Edwards was not at fault in this. We'd like to have contact with the family again. Uh, so you know, there was definitely something interesting going on there. But the Holton, they, they became high society. The Holton House was the site of, of a lot of uh, uh, balls. They had, they have a, there was a ballroom built in the house. And they had a lot of uh, events held in there. Uh, this was a picture of their, their sitting room. That's uh, Charles and Lida Holton. And I, this is we just have a copy of this from the provincial archives. So. I don't have the original to, to really dig into, but it looks really odd because there's a dog up there and there's something on the floor that kind of looks like a baby, but it's mm -hmm. kind of weird looking. <laughs> We've always called this the ghost baby picture because it, it looks a little odd. But this, that, uh, that sitting room still exists in the house. It's the, the, that first little bay window in the home there. And uh, they, Mrs. Uh, Holton raised her niece, Mary Edwards, who was the, the daughter of her uh, brother, James. And uh, James, uh, when he came here, he had his daughter with him. Uh, his wife, we presume, had, had died at some point, but we, I haven't found any record of her death. But um, 
Mary's mother was uh, born in Massachusetts, and she married James Edwards in 1888. Uh, Lida, the younger sister, was 12 years old at the time, and I've got a um, history from the family. They said that James walked into their house with this uh, beautiful girl one day and simply said, Mother, I'd like you to meet my wife. Mother said, Who is she? Where'd you get her? Where did she come from? And Lida ran screaming up the stairs. <laughs> because her older brother had gotten married. Mm -hmm. But they uh, ended up taking, raising, uh, raising Mary after uh, her, her father uh, remarried. And uh, uh, Lida took Mary and raised her uh, probably from about the, uh, the age of 10. And here she is in 1910 on her wedding day, uh, getting married to um, Dr. J.H. Hamilton. And they lived in a house on uh, Mackenzie Avenue this kitty corner from the United Church, the corner of Third and Mackenzie. Uh, there was a Molson Bank in Revelstoke uh, opened in uh, 1898, and it was owned by the Molson family that had the brewery. It was um, the building at the corner of First and Mackenzie, where the everything Revelstoke is now. That was the second bank building that was built there in 1910. But um, Mrs. Molson worked here for a while, and these are unusual photographs, especially uh, especially the, especially this one, because there she is actually having her picture taken with a uh, Chinese man who's obviously not well off at all. And uh, this was probably uh, there were quite a few what was referred to as Chinese shacks in the uh, Columbia Park area, and uh, they were uh, bor um, burned down by the uh, health department of, uh, in uh, 1899, and uh, I'm assuming that was probably one of the shacks that got burned down. And then here she is having her picture taken with her, her cook. And of course, the Chinese people didn't have a lot of uh, options available to them for employment. Cooks was, uh, being a cook in a, White Household was one of them. Uh, this is an interesting story. When we're talking about women's history, you know, there weren't a lot of Chinese women here, and I'll get into that in a little bit um, with a couple of photographs. Uh, so just a photograph of uh, some early families. The, um, the Dickies were uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dickie here. They, oh, sorry. They came to uh, Revelstoke, uh, Earl Dickey came, or William Dickey came in uh, about uh, 1886, and uh, his wife followed uh, shortly after. And uh, when she came here, she talked about, um, she, they were just living, stayed her first night in a hotel on, on Front Street, and uh, she opened up the window of her room the next day, and she saw the local constable, Jack Kirkup, walking across the street with a drunk under each arm, <laughs> starting him off to the jail. And that was her introduction to Revelstoke. Um, but um, she was a very talented musician, and uh, she became the organist for a lot of the, the churches in town. Uh, most of them at that time were meeting in the old Ar Northwest Mounted Police Barracks at the top of Douglas Street Hill. So she was doing the, uh, playing the organ for, for most of the, the church congregations here. Uh, they built a house in 1898 or 99 on this location. And then uh, when they decided that this would be the, the location for the post office, they moved their house. And I think it's uh, the corner of, uh, I believe it's Pearson and Third. It's kind of a bluish green house. Um, a couple of, an early wedding photograph, uh, Addie Hamilton and John Peter Nelson, or Nielsen, um, she came here quite uh, early with her family. They were here in about 1890, and um, she was the oldest of, of several children. Her mother died in childbirth in 1890, so she was raising the rest of her siblings <coughs> until she, uh, she married uh, Peter Nielsen. And uh, they had property in the Columbia Park area, a, a farm up there. He was one of the very early packers into the Big Bend. Now you're probably noticing something when I'm talking about these women. I'm always talking about their husbands too. Uh, and that's because we know way more about the husbands' lives than we do about the wives' lives. So uh, that's 
it, and if you if you would read an obituary on a woman, that's what the obituary would say too. It would say you know, who she was, but it would say who her husband was and what he did. And it's so easy to default into that because that's how women's lives were were defined. Kathy, do you know was there like a dressmaker in town, or did they make like that's a beautiful dress? Yeah, there were dressmakers. Um, the uh, Corsier um, General Store, he had a dressmaker and a milliner. Mm -hmm. A milliner was a hat maker. Mm -hmm. So yes, a lot of the a lot of the department stores would, would have their own dressmakers. And then I think there were women who worked independently as dressmakers as well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they'd uh, probably order them from the Eden's mm -hmm. catalog and have them sent in. And then once there were stores like the C.B. Hume's department store in the uh, in the, like they were, he, op he opened his first store in 1893, and then uh, by 1903 he was right where the Royal Bank is now, and he had a full like, women's uh, department. Uh, they had a dry goods department with where they'd have milliners working uh, and uh, dressmakers working, and then they also had uh, pre-made dresses for sale as well. Um, this is uh, Selma uh, Upper, and uh, Selma Turnross, she came to Revelstoke in 1885 with her family. She was just a, a, a child at the time, probably um, around 10 or over, so you know, um, young girl or, or early teen. And uh, her family had, uh, had property at Greeley, they also had property in town, they had a livery stable. And uh, she was probably one of the early uh, women, um, business women in town. She had, uh, she and her sister were running a store on Mackenzie Avenue where they were uh, selling uh, fruit, but they all, they had a millinery as well. So they were, they were doing hat making. And um, she eventually married uh, Reg Upper, who was one of the first uh, police constables in town. And uh, they had a beautiful house in, um, the Columbia Park area, and uh, in 1919, her husband uh, died in a tragic shooting accident. He was coming back from a hunting trip with uh, his friend uh, Guy Barber, and they parked their store in front of Guy Barber's, or their car in front of Guy Bar Barber's jewelry store on Mackenzie Avenue, and as they were getting out, they had a couple of hunting dogs in the car, and one of them jumped and hit the trigger of the oh. gun that was still loaded and it discharged into her husband's, Mr. Upper's chest and, mm -hmm. and killed him, leaving her with, I think they had about seven children at the time that, that he died. So she ended up raising the, her children on her own. She didn't wish so, Eileen Upper? Yes, uh, it'd be um, her husband. Eileen Upper's mother-in-law. Mother oh. What year do you think that picture is? That picture was probably taken in the 60s, late 60s, mm -hmm. so she was an elderly lady at that time. Uh, I don't think I have it here, but I do have a picture of her and her husband in front of their, their house. Yeah, I didn't put it on this slideshow. Uh, this is the Smith home on Campbell Avenue, and that would be right about where the the liquor store is, or just beyond the liquor store where the, the parking lot is for the tourism office. And uh, the Smith family was um, living there in the, um, the uh, they came in uh, um, 1888, um, oh sorry, uh, John Lewis Smith came in 1888 as, C as a CPR agent, and his wife, uh, they married in 1891 and she joined him here. And um, they said that she talked about how bad the mosquitoes and black flies were uh, when she first came and they had to enclose all their beds with netting. And the corner of their land had a beaver dam on it. There was a lot of, it was quite marshy in that area at the time. Um, they said there was actually a small lake where the Remax Hotel, or the, where the Remax office is now. And they filled it in with uh, rubbish and logs and gravel, and that's where they built the Climax Hotel, which uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, uh, Mary uh, Smith referred to as a hell hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, she told the story of uh, when the Salvation Army were in town, they were campaigning outside the Climax Hotel, and the owner came out and uh, turned a hose on them. <laughs> uh, this is um, Mrs. 
this is uh, Isabel Corsier, Isabel Steed Corsier, and uh, she married um, Henry Noble Corsier, who had come here in the 1880s and had uh, a general store on Front Street. And they had a beautiful home. They actually gave their home a name. They called it Belly in the Hinch. And it was at the north end of, uh, sorry, the south end of Front Street, where the, that big apartment building is now, that Rivers, Riverside, Rivers Edge, Rivers Edge Apartments. And yeah, they had a beautiful home there. She was a, a really a talented gardener, and they had uh, huge flower beds there. Uh, she was also a very talented painter. She, uh, we have some of her paintings on display in the little parlor area downstairs. You can have a look at them on your way out. And um, she organized some of the other paint painters in town, and she gave lessons. She was also doing painting on porcelain. And um, she was the first woman to get on the, uh, uh, on the school board in the 1920s, and was also when they formed the Port Parks Board here in the 1920s. She was uh, on the Parks Board as well. And they had their, their horse was named Buckskin. Uh, she was also active in the suffragette movement in the, that formed here in the, between about 1912 and 1916 when women were working to, to get the vote. And there's another picture of, uh, of Buckskin and Mrs. Corsier and on the, uh, with her is her daughter who is also Isabel, <coughs> but uh, often referred to as Pat. And I'll talk about Pat a little later. She had her own claim to fame. Uh, threw in a couple of wedding photographs here. This is uh, James Bill, uh, married Edith Abrams in 1922. Uh, very 1922 style mm -hmm. uh, dresses. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are the uh, parents of uh, Edith Defoe, uh, Babs Defoe, mm -hmm. who some people will, uh, yeah, Babs Defoe. Uh, some people will remember. And this is another 1920s wedding, uh, Ernest Taylor and Helen Elma Bradshaw. And mm -hmm. Helen Bradshaw is the aunt of Helen Grace. That's who Helen Grace is named after. Mm -hmm. And this is an earlier wedding. This is 1898, the first wedding at Elbert Canyon. Uh, Charles Carlson <coughs> and Ms. Tina Johnson. So, lovely picture of uh, one of the Italian families in town, Rosa and Anselmo Pragolini, and their children. <coughs> and uh, she also had a sister who came out with her. And uh, her sister married one of Anselmo's brothers. That was very common, that uh, for two brothers to marry, uh, marry two sisters. And the um, Gallicano, Dominic Gallicano, uh, seated with his uh, children, Ida, who uh, uh, married uh, Emil Kularch, and Tangri Gallicano, and Sylvia Gallicano. And um, Ida uh, married into the Kularch family. So this is Ida's husband, Emil uh, Kularch. And the name was originally uh, Colacurcio. That's my mother. Yeah. Um, right there. That, that's your mother. And her name was? Mary, Mary, or Maria Nina to start with. Yeah. yeah. And so, if uh, when we're trying to date this photo here, for the, it really hinges on how old you think the girl is. She was born in early 1898, so this could be if you thought she was like. And she six. was so many years younger than her near than Neil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was ten. Yeah, yeah. So um, Emil was known as Neil. He was known yeah, locally yeah, as yeah, Neil yeah, Collars, yeah, just yeah, then. Emilio. Yeah. yeah. And this is uh, the father, Frank. Yeah, yeah Francesco. And yeah. Celestra. Ch Celestra. Yeah. And the, we have Celestra's, yeah. Celestra's yeah. dress on display yeah. in the next room, the beautiful blue mm -hmm. dress. And this is? Angelo. Angelo. Angelo's youngest daughter has just turned 100 last fall. Mm -hmm. She lives in Vancouver. Oh. Yeah. Wow. She's got all her marbles. Yeah. Yeah. And this is? Giovanina, known as Jenny. Okay. And she's the one who married um, to fail. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this could be like 1904, mm -hmm. roughly. Yeah. And the, the wedding of, uh, we were, saw this picture at the last time with, uh, when Rosemary was talking about the Italian history. So there's the wedding of 
Christy Baraducci, who was born in Revelstoke in 1898, and uh, Katerina ba Baffaro, when they married in 1925. Mm -hmm. And uh, very 1920s, they actually have a, a Cupid doll oh. on the front of the car. <laughs> And then just I threw in some pictures of some of the uh, other families from the community. This is the Ozero family here. that lived at Mount Carche <laughs> for years. And uh, so this is, do you know who everyone, who everyone is in that picture, Barry? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, this is, is Artem Ozero. And, uh, sorry, I'm leaning on my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so Artemo Zero and uh, his uh, some of his family. I think is this one. Jim. That's that's Grandpa Jim on the right, on the top right. That's Jim. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, your grandfather. Yeah. 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 And the next one would have been uh, Louis, I think. Louis. John, John and, and Steve, Steve. Or, uh, Tony. Tony. Yeah, so they were some of the early settlers at Mount Karshe, a uh, Ukrainian community. And um, some of them had farms down there for for many years. So when did the name get spelled differently? Um, some of them had came over, uh, when they came over, they said that when they entered Canada, they put uh, ERO. Oh. And uh, it was a, two of the, or one of the, uh, Louis' family stuck with the IRO, and uh, the rest of them went the ERO. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, that was very common for those little name changes to happen when, you know, when we were talking about the, the Colarge, yeah. they started as Colcurtio, <laughs> and it was very common for names to get anglicized or just altered. Or, do you know the, the women's names? Do you know any of them? Do you know the women's names? That would be Eva Eva Hollick on the left, or Eva Zero, and Nettie Kozak, and then that's Polly. That's our Arnold's wife. wife. Okay. Is that not Eva there? Mm, I think that was her on the left. Um. There was three. Uh, Two girls and four boys. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah. But so that, some of those are wives then. That's a, that would be grandpa's wife then. Like Olga. Sitting oh. below. Okay. Yeah. So some, some of these were wives today. And that that would be Auntie Mary on the next tour. Yeah. Below yeah. Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This, you know, this I think this is a, a an example of the uh, a lot of the, the farms. The uh, the women were doing a lot of the work, but they didn't often didn't always get the credit for it. Um, In this family, uh, um, three three brothers married three sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was very common. Too far to walk to town for a date. <laughs> 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 um, so this is the the Kwong family, and I was talking before about uh, the uh, the Chinese community. The um, in the 1911 census, there were more than a hundred more than a hundred uh, Chinese people living in town, and only one of them was a woman. And um, mo but about half of the men were listed as being married as most of their wives were still back in China, became what was known as a bachelor society uh, because they either weren't able to bring their, their wives over, partly because of the head tax or, or for other reasons, or didn't feel they were settled enough here. Uh, but, the, uh, but John Kwong was uh, able to come over with his wife. They came over about 1907, and all of their children were born in uh, in Revelstoke, with the exception of one who was born in Edmonton when they lived there for a while. But these are their, um, and there's a couple of other family members here. This is a uh, 
a relative, this is John, and a, rel a relative of his and his wife and baby and another child, we don't know what his relation is to the family, and that's Yivong Kwong, and their two oldest children, Jean and Sam. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jean became the first woman, in uh, Chinese woman in Canada to graduate as a nurse. Mm -hmm. and she uh, started her training here in Revelstoke when they had the nurses training school, and then she went on to uh, Vancouver uh, to complete her training there, or um, to Westminster, I believe. And uh, her younger sister, youngest sister, Mary, who is um, not the Mary Kwong who lives in town. The Mary Kwong who lives in town was married to John, one of the, the brothers. But Mary Kwong Lee, uh, Jean's youngest sister, uh, she's still alive. She's in Vancouver now. But she told me several years ago that when Jean graduated, she was the top student in the class, but they wouldn't give her the prize for top student. Oh. Mm -hmm because she was uh, Chinese. But she kind of, she was really the one that broke that barrier. And then uh, a couple of her sisters also became nurses. Little, little child that, uh, that is born, or is it a, a white? I think it's yeah. that I had a headpiece that, uh, that the child was wearing. Yeah. So you're saying one is John's wife and the other woman is Someone else's wife? Uh, we believe it's the wife of this young man. Oh, okay. So in 1911, John's wife would have been the one woman on the census? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and this picture was probably <coughs> taken about 1915 or so. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and this, the location, this was their house and laundry, and it's uh, located right where the um, um, community, the um, senior center is now. Mm -hmm. Right about where the entry, the, the back entry to the community center, right there. Okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but the one daughter married to Peter Wing, who became the first Chinese mayor in Canada. In North America. North America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was the mayor of Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Jun Ling, and she was the wife of Wing Chung, who was a, a Chinese merchant in town. And um, there was this note from the newspaper in uh, 1921 uh, that said, um, Mrs. Wing Chung buried in China. Um, it says, an information reached the city this week of the death from asthma of Mrs. Wing Chung, a well-known and highly respected resident of Revelstoke for the past 15 years, in the 35th year of her age. Some months ago, deceased left to spend a holiday trip at her old home in China, <coughs> and last month left to return to Canada. She was not apparently in the best of health when she left, and two days out from Hong Kong, she passed away. On the arrival of the boat at Shanghai, her body was shipped back to Hong Kong for burial. Mr. Wing Chung continued the homeward trip after the funeral, arriving in Vancouver about a week ago on the Empress of Russia. And uh, Wing Chung had, uh, had six sons who were born in Revelstoke, and uh, we believe that he had three wives. And um, I met with the, the uh, family probably close to 30 years ago. Um, Wing Chung's son, Sam Lai Mi, was, uh, was here visiting, and he had some of his family here as well, and they were talking about uh, their family history, and they were trying to figure out you know, who's, who's, whose mother was whose. <laughs> and um, Sam Lai said, well, the wives were not consecutive, they were concurrent. <laughs> oh, he had three wives and he had three wives <laughs> at the same time. Uh, because they were trying to figure out the ages of all these kids, that wasn't making sense. Right? Um, one of the jobs that was open to them in back then would be that, that of a telephone operator. And this was possibly taken in the um, what's now the, the cable office. That was the, the telephone office at one time. Uh, there's a picture of a girl feeding the hens at Hall's Landing in 1928, Mary Landfield. And the nurses at Queen Victoria Hospital in 1920. And as I mentioned, they had a nurses training school there that ran from 1914 till the 1930s. And this absolutely adorable picture 
help us uh, nurse Beer Nelson with the little patient, <laughs> who obviously has an owie on his eye. Cold <laughs> behind him. What's that? Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never noticed that before. <laughs> Um, I talked about uh, Lydia Hume not, not that long ago. She was um, one of Revelstoke's first school teachers in the 1890s, and then she married J. Fred Hume, and they moved to Nelson, that's Hume of the Hume Hotel fame, and uh, Mrs. Wilkes' kindergarten class in 1901. And uh, this little girl is uh, Shella Dickey, the so, uh, sister of Earl Dickey and daughter of William and Sarah that I was talking about before. And uh, when I first started working here, I was taking photographs and artifacts up to the uh, Queen Victoria Hospital, the, to the long-term care unit, and she was, she was there then. And I brought this photograph up, and she couldn't get over her hat. She <laughs> loved that little hat. Um, one of the early school teachers in town, Miss Burris, with her class. And the teacher's picnic in 1908. Oh. Um, the uh, principal at the time was um, A. E. Miller, that Miller Lake is named after, and he was a great believer in outdoor exercise, so he would always take his teachers on these long rambles and hikes <laughs> in the area. Uh, so another, I don't know the name of the, the woman, but there's a woman working in the accounting office at the CBM department store. That was in the upper floor of the building. And uh, Mrs. Williamson, who later became Mrs. Benison, of uh, Benison's Bakery, which is now a modern bake shop. And uh, Mrs. Maley and her uh, greenhouse on the Big Bend Road, they ran a floral greenhouse there for uh, about uh, 20 years. Um, this woman deserves a talk of her own. I think I have done a talk on her before and probably will again. This is Alice Jowett who was the owner of the Windsor Hotel that's still standing at Trout Lake and probably one of the more successful miners in the Lardo area. She had uh, the foggy day and other claims around um, in the hills around um, Trout Lake and uh, she was still going into her claims in, in her 90s and was still running the hotel in her 90s. She lived to be 101. A picture of her in her later age, later years, with her family members. Um, I've got lots more photographs, but I think I'll probably stop it here. Um, but I'm going to just skip ahead to the end because I have some advertising to do. I'll do this as a second, uh, a second talk another time. Um, but. Uh, wanted to remind everybody about our suffragettes tea that's happening uh, this weekend and we're going to be set up outside here we're getting uh, the two big rotary tents uh, so in case that it, uh, it will not rain but uh, just in case we have two uh, big tents set up there and uh, our uh, we've got a, a crew that busy at work that are going to be making uh, sandwiches and dainties mm -hmm. and uh, we'll have two sittings for the tea but uh, this is way more than just a tea we have uh, Anita Halliwas uh, is uh, directing a, uh, a little play by some of the local actors and they are going to be portraying the uh, suffragette movement that was happening in Revelstoke at that time leading up to women getting the votes there were there were ac active suffragettes here and um, we're going to have the, um, the then Premier of British Columbia, Richard McBride, is going to be here. And uh, Nellie McClung is going to be here. And uh, a few, uh, some, some, uh, some very strident suffragettes, as well as a few dissenters. And it's something you're not going to want to miss. Uh, there we have two tea sittings at 11 o'clock and at 1 o'clock. Uh, and even if you're downtown, you're going to be, they're, they're going to, the suffragettes are going to be doing a little bit of campaigning downtown <laughs> before they get here to the museum. And uh, we also have a uh, group of singers from Vernon coming. They're called the Vernon Kalamalka Chorus. And if you, I don't know if you've ever heard of Sweet Adeline singers, 
they're the female version of barbershop quartet. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be doing the Sweet Adeline uh, style of singing in the period songs, all from, from that era. Uh, so you get way more than your tea and coffee. You get a great show. Um, and we're having a lot of fun pulling this together, so I uh, hope everybody can make it to that. There will be prizes for best cost period costumes, so... Uh, Any recommendations where to get our hats? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, a straw hat and as many flowers as you can put on it, <laughs> or birds, or just... Uh, we're waiting to see how creative people can get with the costumes. And then uh, just to remind you, we've got our ongoing project, Snapshot of History. And uh, every week on uh, Facebook, we put a gallery of, of photos, encourage you to vote for them. And I also have the photos up in the hallway. Uh, each, gal or each week I put the gallery up. But I've also put the past galleries into a binder. So if you want to come by, if you don't use Facebook, come on by and go through and mark your favorites off there. And at the end of October, we'll figure out our top 150 photographs. What's leading the pack right now, Kathy? Uh, the, the, the top photograph is still Henry Okamura and Mr. Woods, the oldest <laughs> Orenka skiers in Revelstoke in 1960. Henry was, was one year old. Mr. Woods was 77. That's, uh, that's got over 100 votes. So yeah. that's still our forerunner. And then, of course, on Friday, May 12th, we're having the filming of Revelstoke Kiss in the Wind at the Revelstoke Performing Arts Center. Uh, they, uh, we're selling tickets here and online through the Arts Council website uh, for uh, $20. And uh, we'll have uh, refreshments there as well from Love Again. And uh, we're setting up uh, displays. The Railway Museum will be doing a display on the Connaught Tunnel and uh, Rosemary Tracy and the Italian Canadian Club are doing their display on Italian history mm -hmm. and I'll have a little display from the museum and Parks Canada will be there as well and they'll have their green screen if, mm -hmm. uh, if you've never seen the green screen before it's super fun they set this up and they have historic photographs so you can choose your historic photograph and then get in the photograph and, and uh, get your photograph taken <laughs> Um, and then have it have it sent to you. So um, we encourage people to to do that. Um, it's, uh, the film is really lovely, and of course the bonus here is that the director and producer are coming over from Italy, so they'll be there for a question and answer after the film as well. So the film is very day. very good. It's a lovely Excellent. film. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a tearjerker almost. Yep, it is. Very moving film. And I'm in it. <laughs> the, the one day of filming is related to about uh, three minutes of uh, yeah. footage. So uh, thanks again for coming. And uh, sorry I was a bit rough.